Hello again. It's a typical October afternoon. The river is in absolutely super trim. And this is one of those classic day swims. And today I've asked Dave to come down and, and really show us how an expert fishes a stick float. Sit back and watch this. I think you'll enjoy it. This really is one of those classic swims, isn't it? It's a fantastic swim, isn't it? It's, um, like you say, it's sort of textbook stick float stuff, this is. You know, it, it took about half an hour to get the first bite today, but now we're getting a bite every single cast. They're not all dace. A few, there's a few bleaking amongst them, but um, it's real active fishing. And it's enjoyable. Ah, it's superb. I love catching dace, I do. It's, um, it's just interesting, just trying to get your feed right and manoeuvring a shoal around, you know, it's like, like I say, I mean, you, the first half an hour you could have thought, well, we're not going to get any bites at all the way this is going. And then suddenly, I've just kept feeding and kept feeding and suddenly out of the blue, the fish have just appeared. The lovely thing about pleasure fishing is that you draw them, don't you? Yeah, you that's, that's the importance of feeding them in all the way through. You know, every time we've gone out fishing recently, Dave, we've been talking about the importance of feed. So, like today, I brought along around about six pints of maggots, a couple of pints of hemp, and uh, I would expect, I'm only going to stay here for about sort of four hours today, but I would expect to get through the whole lot. You know, I mean, I'm getting a big response now to big handfuls of maggots. And it's important just to keep the bait going in to bring the fish, keep the fish coming. Mm. It's noticeable also when we talked about waggler fishing with the dumpy waggler that your stick floats for this kind of fishing are very similar aren't they? Yeah well, I brought along quite a lot of floats here today as you can see on the tray and um, again the important thing is here because it's so fast is not to go for too thin a tip because a you won't see it and b every time it touches the bottom it's going to drag under. Mm. I mean they're quite bold biting fish um, you know so the important thing is to have a nice thick visible tip sticking up that we can see and uh, if I do have to run a long way down the swim I can still see it you know if yeah. it's like 20 yards away I can still see the float top and I notice you oh <laughs> yeah our old friends the bleak are back <laughs> you're going for the big stuff eh? <laughs> <laughs> I notice that also you've, you seem to have a, a couple of killing grounds and you're holding the float back there. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these fish are right the way up the swim now, right at the top end of the swim. And I'm feeding just slightly upstream. Um, but as it's going on, I'm not feeding quite so far up as I was. Because there's a danger that the fish can come up right in front of me. So the important thing is to get my hook bait going down in amongst where the feed is, where the fish are. You know, And at the moment, because the swim's so shallow, I mean, you can see I'm fishing about what, three and a half foot deep. Um, the fish are just, just slightly downstream of where I'm sat. But it's real fast, active fishing. I mean, if it carries on like this, we'll definitely have a good weight by the end. There was a period of time, Dave, when they used to advertise stick float rods and waggler rods. I never really understood it myself. But what do you look for in a stick float rod? Well, well this rod's quite powerful, but, but you are right. I mean, years ago it was, it was classed that spliced tit rods were generally regarded as stick float rods and um, hollow tips were generally waggler rods but these days I mean <coughs> hollow tips are so good so fine in the tip that uh, you don't really need a splice at all for stick float fishing you know I mean I, I don't carry a, a splice tip rod at all now <coughs> this rod's quite a powerful beast but um, I'm fishing fairly robust tackle today and the, the nice thing about this is if I do start to connect a few chub or barbel perhaps you know the, the rod's suitable for it mm -hmm. It's been a strange sort of a day, hasn't it? I mean, the sun's trying to come out now. Yeah, it's gorgeous. It is nice. What is there on the river now? About one and a half foot, two foot? I reckon maybe a couple of foot, but I mean, the colour's good. Um, last week it was carrying quite a lot of sort of peaty colour, but um, it's fine enough, nice enough. Perfect conditions to catch, and condi catch dace in shallow water like this. But also we get into that time of day, aren't we? I always remember when we used to fish the Trent all those years ago and invariably in the last hour of the match you could just run the stick float down the stones and always picked up those quality ropes. Better and... fish as the day goes on. Yeah, yeah. And the Y is, is, a, is a special sort of river. So it's, it's unlike any other river that I ever fished to be honest because there are so many fish here. 
the key to it is, is, is feeding. You've just got to keep some feed going in. If you don't catch, then it just means there's no fish in front of you. And that, that's the bottom line, really. I mean, I'm putting a good handful of hemp in every so often and a decent handful of maggots every cast. Just to keep what does the hemp do? Well, the hemp really gets through. It gets through to the bottom and it, it's, a good, it's a good holding bait for, for all sorts of species, really. Um, I mean, sometimes on this river, if, if bleak trouble is too bad, then I would switch just to feeding hemp. Maybe with a few casters, but at the moment, the two baits are working well together. I think if I have a favourite way of fishing, this is it. Yeah, it's special, isn't it? It's a special way of catching. Well, I think it's a... You're just in control, aren't you? I always feel with a waggler that the waggler tends to fish itself. I think on this type of river, I mean, if you look out in front of us, the river's actually getting shallower towards mid-river, so we've got, we've got two, two bands of slightly deeper water. Now, yeah. I could waggler fish past middle, but like you say, control would be difficult in this sort of speed of current. Um, so I've elected to fish this side of the middle where it's slightly deeper, you know, with, with a view to catching dace. And uh, so far it's working, and it's working well for these big <laughs> things as well. I can think of a number of winter leagues when I would have been glad of a You know, the crazy thing like is, that. the crazy thing about bleak fishing is that on the days that you don't want them on this river, you normally catch stacks. And on the days that you do, I mean, for instance, last week I fished um, a team match up at Hereford and I've set up five whips specifically to catch bleak because all the talk was the bleak was going mad. And, um, you know, I caught eight, <laughs> eight bleak in about half an hour. Mm. When, we, um, when we went to Barston Lakes uh, pole fishing, which I enjoyed immensely, um, you were talking about the pole float and I think you said you used, um, was it 0.5 point, per foot? Point, no, point, point point 0.4. 0.1 of a gram but, right, per, per foot. foot of water, yeah. Right. It, is that a similar uh, way that you assess what stick float to use? Actually, or, it is. It, I mean, what I tend to do, I fish... Um, when, I, when I get to a swim that I don't know, what I normally do is just, just add any sort of light stick float on there and just tie a very heavy plummet on. I mean, that takes about... That's about two ounces. Right. And... Um, by doing that, I can search out the riverbed and work out the depth. And what I tend to do thereafter is roughly I use a, a number four shot per foot of depth. You know, so if it's like four foot deep, four number four and so on. It's, there's no hard and fast rules on that. I mean, today I've gone slightly heavier. I've gone for a six number four um, in, the, in four foot of water. You know, just to give me that little bit more control because it is going through very pacey. Yeah. But as a general rule of thumb, if you go for... Like a number four per foot of depth, it's about right. And again, you've opted for the thick top. Yeah. Presumably for buoyancy again. Yeah, absolutely vital. Yeah, buoyancy and visibility. You know, I can see it a long way down the swim now. This is, this is a wonderful swim, really, actually, because you could actually go half a mile, couldn't you? you know, it well, yeah. It goes on got, forever. We've got forever. It? It's... Um, it's just a fantastic river, isn't it, the Y? It's just a wonderful, wonderful river. It just changes in character so much as you look as you look down, you know, there's trees overhanging. There's a ford down there, you know, usually the, the pegs just below fords are quite good for chub. Um, you really are sport for choice, and when you get in the deeper water, a little bit further upstream, it's good for big roach as well. Well, as you pointed out to me quite recently, there's no locks. No, this, this, this starts in Wales and goes out to sea and there's nothing to stop it, is there? Yeah, that's, 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 ah. the, ha -ha. Yeah, that's the first fish I've lost for 16 years. <laughs> <laughs> Honest. <laughs> but, uh, no, you're right. It, it, and as a consequence of that, because there are no locks and no weirs, the river comes up really fast and drops fast. You know, I mean, there was one match I came on here a few years ago where it actually rose 10 foot in, in a five-hour match. You know, so you've started, started the match off down the bank. And you've ended up right on top of the bank by the end. Incredible. But, you know, we've also had some really good competitions on here where the river's been carrying sort of six or seven foot of water, where every other single river in the country would just be a complete washout, you know. Key to its colour. And I think that's an element that a lot of people don't understand, isn't it? That um, the effect that has on fish and their desire to feed. 
it, it's just a constantly changing thing. I mean, I, I, could, I could bring you on pegs on this river and we could fish the same peg over, say, a three or four week period and we'd, we'd probably end up fishing it different every time, you know, as regards methods. And, and really, that's one of the things that, that turns me on about the river. I mean, every time I drive to the Y, I think about, you know, I feel excited. Um, and one day you might get there and it's low and you might be fishing a waggler down the middle and the next day it's a bit higher and you're on a stick float and the next day it's higher still and you're fishing with, you know, a bolo type float with ground mm. bait. Um, that's the beauty of it, it's constantly changing. You know, Dave, just watching you do that, uh, you make the stick float look so easy, and yet, for an awful lot of people, just keeping the line behind the float is as much as they can do. I think it's just, all about, it's about practice, isn't it, this? Um, and casting it in downstream. I mean, it's easier, it's easier to actually cast in on a left to right current. These are taking this on a drop now, aren't they? Yeah, there's a fantastic head of fish down here now. I mean, bleak is still a problem, but I'm finding that by fishing just a little bit further out than I was, <coughs> that I'm catching Damon. Look at that. Nice stamp. Fantastic fish. Nice isn't stamp, it? yeah. Well, are they four to the pound? Yeah, probably some of them are probably sort of three, I would imagine. But everyone's perfect. They're all brand new, I think. Look, they've never been caught before, these fish. Yeah. If you watch the way I cast, I mean, it, it, people, people often find if, you're right, if you fish right-handed like I do, sometimes it's a bit difficult because I often see people cast in and they sort of cast like that and yeah. it goes upstream. Yeah. Um, I find the easiest way to do it, I mean, there's a couple of ways of doing it. You could actually swing the rod round and cast it like that to lay it in the line backwards. But the, by far the easiest way on shallow water is just to cast out, keep some tension in the rod when you've taken the bail arm off cast out and then and then just flick it back as it hits the water yeah. it's almost a stop action isn't it yeah and the whole thing just lays lays in the line but all, you're always starting off with the float downstream you know there, there's nothing worse than, than casting upstream and waiting for everything to correct itself and then yeah. to flick line back so when would you going down. Hmm. when would you fish with a with a back shot you know something, down the years, I've read so many features about people using back shots and this, that and the other, and I never do it. It's, it's not something I do. If I have major problems with downstream winds, I tend to fish either a heavier float, a different type of float, maybe a bolo type rig, or a waggler. And, and it's just something that's never, ever worked for me, you know. Um, and I know people do it when they've got downstream winds, and I know it's been a popular thing on the Trent and probably people watching this. I think I've got, I'm totally mad, but um, you know, it's just something that doesn't suit me at all. I was just thinking when you were talking earlier about, about the river, it, you and I can remember when, when it was the salmon anglers that dominated this river, there was hardly any matches on it at all, was there? That's right, I mean, and, and for many years, I know the coarse anglers, I mean, before my time really, but the coarse anglers, had a bad deal of it really, they couldn't fish up with maggots. Got a tangle around the rod to it there. They weren't allowed to fish with maggots until um, I think it was the end of October. Yes, I think it was. Like that. But obviously now, I mean, I, I don't know how many, how popular salmon fishing is on this river now, but um, it's certainly not as good as it used to be. I think that's and, true most places. And you know, and everything's sort of changed now. I mean, the coarse mm. fishing is more and more popular. I mean, the, the competitions I fish in Hereford. You know, they get real good turnouts and yeah. there's a waiting list for some of the matches to come. Well, you know, years and years ago, the, the Y Championships, you couldn't get a ticket. Yeah, well, it's, it's the same now, but I mean, maybe it's not the same size it used to be. But um, we've certainly got a sort of between 150 and 200 yeah. pegs coming up. I remember one of the first times I came down and I was, uh, I think I was the editor of Course Fisherman magazine at the time, and I did a, an article with Joe Brennan and Laurie Hickman of Brennan and Hickman fame. And uh, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they fished for the West End Club. That's right, yeah. Whitmoreens. Whitmoreens, that was it. Yeah. And they were devastating, but they used to fish um, the bread. Yeah. 
big top and bottom floats and go cartwheeling out across the river. Has you know, that method died out now? Well, the bread is still a very popular bait with certain anglers, but um, what i found the last, last few years that I've been fishing on here is that whilst there are loads of chub in the river, that the, the average stamp is maybe not as big as it used to be. I mean, there are still some, some big, big fish. I mean, I had, I had chub up to sort of six pound four in last, last season. <laughs> How big do you want them? Um, <laughs> You know, and, and there's plenty of sort of four and five pounds, but generally, in a lot of the matches that we fish, the, the average stamp tends to be about sort of one to two pound. And what I found was it was better, certainly last winter, fishing with a bunch of maggots rather than bread, you know. And the beauty of that was if you were fishing down the middle of the river on a big float, if you struck and you've got three or four maggots on a, on a size 12 hook or whatever, the beauty of it is that when you strike, the bait's still on. If yeah. you've missed a bite, you can just take the pressure off, let it go again. And, you know, over the course of, of a five-hour session, to me, that sort of adds up to a, a lot of time saved, whereas, like, the bread man, he strikes, the bread comes off, he's got to come all the way back in and, and set up all over again. And, of course, you take the dates out of the equation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, some people fish big baits like that to, take the, to, to actually take them out anyway, but uh, in my experience, certainly last winter, um, if the chub were there in numbers, you caught them doing it with big baits, like I'm saying. You know, and, and the, the beauty of it was, if they weren't there, you could simply sort of scale it down to a couple of maggots and fish for dace. Or bleak. Or bleak. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do when the fish don't respond? I mean, quite clearly here today, you're bringing more and more fish into the swim, but what, a, what about those dog days when you can't buy a bite. Do you still keep feeding heavily? I've never, I've ne on this particular river, this is, this is a special place, you know, it's like feeding light never works on the Y, never ever works. It's like if you're going to, in competitions, which I fish mainly, um, if you're going to win anything, you've got to attack. You've got to keep bait going in. Maybe not six or seven pints, but you've certainly got to feed two or three points at least whereas on other rivers you know like the river on the seven say places like Stourport which is another favorite venue of mine you can have days where you, you have to keep feeding but not very much you know you can put sort of two and three and four maggots in every cast and maybe not even get through a pint in five hours I, mean, I remember one match where I had, 20, I had uh, 17 roach for 21 pound in the depths of winter the snow on the ground and I fed less than half a pint of bait. It was just a case of like trickle the bait in. I actually had it in the top pocket of a, one of these teddy bear suits just to keep the bait warm. <laughs> um, and I've literally sort of just trickle bait in for the whole match and that was the way to feed it, you know. So it, it's, a, it's about feeding to response. Um, What's a teddy bear suit? It's those little uh, fleecy <laughs> things that we used to wear years ago before we had these. <laughs> But, um, oh, I know the things. <laughs> yeah, I know that. I, I think you used to advertise them at that time. They were inside out fleeces, That's weren't it. they? You yeah, got it. I remember That's those. Nice. But yeah. a friend of mine, Dave Howell, came up with it. He, um, he came up with putting like a little handful of maggots in there in the depths of winter and that's what we did. So, uh, but yeah, it, it is about feeding to response. If you're getting lots of bites, put more in, you know, you might catch bigger stamp of fish. Mm. All the time, it's just thinking about what you're doing and how you're feeding it. But, but in this sort of situation, you can confidently feed a lot without worrying about it, I find. And what about the caster? Does the caster work on here? Um, caster I tend to use on this river if I'm using it with ground bait. Um, when we're fishing on the deeper water, you know, if I had sort of eight to ten foot of water today, I might be tempted to use ground bait just to get the feed down to the bottom quickly. In which case, then I would probably use about sort of two to three pints of casters over the course of like five hours. But um, because it's so shallow, I think loose feeding's a better option today. Mm. The red maggot seems to have come into its own in recent years. I know you. Yeah, I always put some in. in you know, when, when I'm catching fish like this, I very rarely try it. But um, it's a particularly good bait. I mean, what I tend to do. If I bought a gallon of maggots for two matches, then I'd put, um, I'd have probably seven pints of whites and a pint of reds into which I put the turmeric um, powder. And I find reds are, is a very good bait for perch. Yes. Um, it's sometimes a good change bait for roach. But as regards dace and, and chub, then I usually go down, you know, the pale bronze route. 
I think we're going to have to start shallowing up a little bit on this rig now. I've, I've left it set at this sort of depth for a while now, so I'm going to just take a foot off and see if it makes a difference. It's set just to sort of dead depth at the present time. Well, I think one of the things that I learned a long, long time ago, and uh, it was John Dean that told it me, actually, the legendary Trent angler. Oh, and he God. had two rigs set up one day. And I asked him what the second rig was for, because it was quite unlike his first rig. And he said, when I'm catching fast, this rig allows me to catch faster. Yeah. And yeah. I think people don't realise that you can uh, improve your catch rate. Yeah. It, it all depends what you want to do, doesn't it? You see, on a pleasure day like this, I still sort of think match if you like because match fishing is where I'm at and it's what I've done for all my life. Um, and like, I mean, look what's happened there. I've got a foot shallower and I'm catching quicker. I mean, I'm getting a bite. I mean, I was getting regular bites, but straight away I'm catching off the bottom, just hanging onto a shallower rig. And, uh, but what I tend to do, you know, is, is over the course of time, I've found that, I mean, five hours is a long time in competition. Mm -hmm. And where a lot of anglers go wrong is that they don't change things enough if they're not catching. And um, there are very few matches where you catch for five hours. Exactly, you know, you'll have a key, a key catching time. Oh! That's a nice one. How about that? There you go, you <laughs> see. Real good method for minnows also. <laughs> we'll put that one straight back. But what I tend to do is give myself sort of blocks of sort of 15 or 20 minutes doing a certain thing you know maybe a certain feed rate or maybe a certain depth on a certain rig i mean you can't do it just on a couple of casts but you know particularly if you've got deep water let's say you've got 12 foot of water there now, now if you're feeding steady the fish could be at any depth yes at all but by changing your depth around and giving yourself 15 minutes here and 15 minutes there eventually over the course of five hours you'll probably find a depth that they want to be at with yeah. the feeding that you're doing and um and that's the key to it really, is experimenting, having, having set different rigs set up and just trying different things, mm. you know. And if you give yourself, I mean, I always make um, one, one little tip I would give you. I always make a mental note against the rod rings of, of where the float is set. So let's say, I mean, today's very shallow, so it doesn't really matter that much, but let's say, for instance, I was catching, it was eight foot deep. I always sort of note against the rod ring how deep it is. So you might find sort of eight foot of water, you know, and you can go back to that depth at any stage when you've been experimenting. Mm. Well, I've enjoyed our trip down to the Y. The problem is Dave makes it look so easy, and I know from experience it's not. He's probably had about 20 pound a day, maybe more. And the fish are literally queuing up. I hope you've enjoyed yourself, I have. And I hope we can see you again soon. Take care. <laughs>